Today on All About Fitness, we are speaking with the Tony Horton. How are you doing today, Tony? Pete, I'm on fire, buddy. Ready to go. Ready to talk about how to save lives, get fit, and talk about wellness, all of it. Food, supplements, mindfulness. Come on, man. Let's cover it all. Well, that's that's one thing. When I was doing a little bit of research, Tony, number one, it's really it's a lot of fun to be talking with you. So thank you for taking the time. But when I was doing the research, I was surprised to find out how long you've been in the fitness game. So could you kind of walk us through how'd you get started in fitness and give us just a kind of a brief overview of your, because people know you from, you know, being whatever on, on uh, promoting products, but what is your, your fitness background? Well, you know, I mean, um, ah, wow. You know, I, I didn't get certified as a trainer until well after I was starting to train people, you know, I mean, I came out to California in 1980 and I fell in love with the lifestyle and, and all the gyms, you know, that I was, uh, you know, using back in college and high school or either on the campus or at the high school gym, you know, it wasn't, you know, there were bodybuilding gyms here and aerobics gyms here. And, you know, and there were people playing volleyball at the beach and skiing in the local mountains and surfing and everything, you know. And so um, I, I just found it very intriguing. I, I didn't show up here in very good shape, but that, that changed as soon as I started joining one gym after another. I was a member of four different gyms at one point just because I wanted, to, you know, different vibe. You know, one had one was this kind of aerobics and the other one was like I was just spying on Arnold and Lou Ferrigno, checking out what they were doing and World Gym back in the old days. And I was a member of Gold's Gym. I was a member of two different gyms that were like, you know, two blocks away from each other. <clears throat> just, to, you know, because I wanted to know what I just was into it. Right. And I wasn't training anybody. I was trying to be a young actor. And I did a little bit of modeling back in those days. But but uh, and a couple of TV commercials and bit parts in movies. You know, I thought I was going to be a cross between Brad Pitt and Jim Carrey, but that didn't turn out. But I, I was, you know, I was an actor and I was doing improv classes and scene study classes. And I was I, I briefly dabbled in stand up comedy, a lot of open mics that were just excruciating, you know, but but a lot of lessons learned. You know, you, your, your skin grows pretty thick when you're exposing yourself to large audiences. And then I had a couple little uh, I hosted a TV show for a while where I had a co-host and, and three cameras and teleprompters to read and. It all kind of started. I mean, for me, I, I had an agent. My agent said, hey, man, you're kind of pudgy and you're kind of scrawny. And if you want to work in this town, pudgy and scrawny is not a good combination. You know what I mean? So I started working out. And, you know, you and I were talking prior to our prior to this conversation about being a production assistant. I was over at 20th Century Fox and I started training my boss, um, you know, because he noticed that I was transforming as a result of what my agent wanted me to do. And if you're a member of four gyms, something's got to happen. You know what I mean? So I was I was at one of them at least five to seven days a week. And I started training this guy, Harlan Goodman, and he used to be in the music industry. And so when he, when he couldn't make a movie and I decided, hey, I don't want to be a carpenter anymore or, I, or the uh, assistant manager of the men's clothing store uh, at the local mall, um, I thought, well, maybe this is going to be a business. I better get I better learn more and get certified. So I finally did. But but I got him in shape and then he lost about 35 pounds and got lean. And, and he was in his 40s at the time. I think I was in my late 20s. And then when he went back to making music again or being involved with music, he was walking down the hall of East End Management and on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And there's Tom Petty walking down the hall in the other direction. Tom Petty sees Harlan and he sees that he's lost all this weight. looks great. And Tom Petty is smoking a cigarette and said, hey, Harlan, you look fantastic. You know, I got a tour coming up in four months and I'm, a, I'm fat and nobody likes a fat rocker. And, you know, what should I do? How did you do it? So he told me about me. Tom calls me up the next day and and my roommate picks up the phone and hangs up on Tom because why would Tom Petty be calling my little apartment <laughs> in Monica? There's no way. So he called back and he thought we got disconnected. But Bob, my roommate goes, dude, I think it's Tom Petty. So I went to his house the next day. And that was really kind of when my career was launched. You know, I got Tom in shape. I had him for four months. He went off on this tour and he looked amazing. I mean, he was wearing, you know, vests, leather vests without shirts and cutting all the sleeves off all the shirts. It was crazy. And he had tons of stamina and his voice was great and his confidence was great. And not that he didn't already have confidence. I mean, he knew what he was doing, but he just knocked the crap out of it. You know what I mean? He just had a, he just did really great. And so then Billy Idol called and then Annie Lennox from the Arrhythmics called and then Stevie Nicks called and then Stephen Stills. Couldn't really help Stephen, but I tried. Mm. And then, um, and then uh, I got, I started training Bruce, the boss on and off when he, he and his wife, Patty Scalfa the nicest human being on earth. And so I, I was all of a sudden, oh my God, I'm training all these rockers, you know? And then I had people like uh, Octavia Spencer, if you know, she's a, uh, if you know who she is and Allison Janney and, and Bryce Dallas Howard and, 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 and uh, Fatone, what was the guy, one of the, uh, 
Oh yeah, the is it in sync or in sync? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had him for a while, and I mean, you know, it was uh, it was crazy, man. Um, I had Lindsey Buckingham, you know, because I was I was at one point training half of Fleetwood Mac, <laughs> you know. But those were the good old days, you know. I didn't have to do all those other little silly jobs that I was doing, and 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 you know, I was doing the stand up and doing the improv and and going doing the acting classes, and life was a dream. I was in my late twenties, early thirties, and still broke. I mean, sixty grand in debt and in a broken down 1966 Mustang rally convertible. Looked good in the garage, but man, the brakes <laughs> would go out and the engine would go out and the transmission would go out, transmission. And I, had to, and I had to buy another crappy old car so I could rotate. And those were the early days, you know, for me. Well, then, those you know, are also, if you don't mind me cutting in, but those are also, Tony, kind of the early days of fitness because LA, late 70s, you know, mid 80s was where fitness, where our current industry happened. And you just kind of, I don't want to say you fell into it because I, I never, there's no such thing as luck. I mean, there's opportunity and preparation. You were doing work. You're, you're putting yourself out there and the right, the right opportunities came up and, and you were able to leverage them. But take us back. I mean, you talk a little bit about who you're working with, but what was that fitness scene like kind of back in the eighties when people were just kind of like starting to get into fitness and, and what's been the most interesting thing about how the industry, how the fitness industry has changed over the past number of years? Um, it was really cardio centric and bodybuilding centric then. And there were completely two different camps. At least that was my personal experience. Yoga was, you know, kind of for the, for the, you know, people who had crystals in their bedroom and things. It wasn't yoga was coming around. Pilates was, you know, had, Pilates been around forever, but it wasn't as popular then. Um, so, you know, I mean, I was a member of an aerobics gym where I would go and I would look in there and I'd see this room filled with like 75 women and I wouldn't see a single guy in there. And, I, and I'd go, are, are guys allowed to go in there? And I go, yeah, well, I'm going in. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I wanted to meet gals. And then the bodybuilding vibe was just a completely, you know, because it was Lou Ferrigno and, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and all the big bodybuilders at the time. Um, and it was, you know, it was cardio and, and resistance. That was kind of fitness. That's what fitness was in the six, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, the sixties. And when I was, when I jumped in in the early eighties. Right. So, and it's, it's, and it was great. I mean, you know, I, I got up to about 185 pounds, but you know, I was, I was about as flexible as a two by four, you know what I mean? I, I couldn't, I wasn't very fast. I didn't know anything about martial arts. I had maybe only started doing yoga around 1990 something, early 1990s. So I was late to the game on some things, but but for me, you know, when when somebody invited me into a yoga class, I thought, oh well, this is, this is going to be a waste of my time. I'll just go sit there and fart around. And then I discovered how difficult it was, and I fell in love with it because it was difficult. I fell in love with running on the track because I had never really had a a real track coach before. I was working with you know former Olympians and learning a little bit about that, you know, and learning about core work and, and functional fitness and. And, you know, now, I mean, you look, you look at it now, I mean, there's Peloton and there's Tonal and there's, of course, Beachbody has all their trainers and, and Lululemon bought the mirror and the mirror is another way to do it. And, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, and, and bodybuilding still around and people are still taking, but the, you know, when I was there, I used to cut off tank tops, you know, with like <laughs> pink and neon green tights that stopped that were, what am I wearing? And, and like those white Reebok shoes, you know what I mean? It's just crazy, man. It's just crazy how it's evolved. But the reality is, you know, if, if you did the same routines that I, that we, a lot of us did back in the seventies and eighties, you'd get fit, you'd get strong. It's, it, you know, people say, well, what works? I say, what works is the thing that you're committed to the thing that you enjoy doing over and over again. It can be anything. I mean, it's important to have objectives. You know, I want to be more flexible or I want to gain some size or I want a six, six pack, but at, you know, at 63 years old, my objective is how can I stay fit and how can I stay healthy and how can I stay flexible and how can I prevent boredom injuries and plateaus, right? So it's boredom injuries and plateaus. I don't care what you're doing. You know, if you keep going to yoga class and you think you're going to do some pull-ups, you can forget about it, right? But, uh, you know, if you think just your, your, your bodybuilding thing is going to help you touch your toes, that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So diversification, I mean, that's what, what P90X was. P90X forced people to do to work on their weaknesses and their strengths. And that product is over 10 years old and people, I still get royalty checks and nobody spends a dime on media for that thing. You know, Beachbody, you can, if you go to the Beachbody site, you can barely find me, but people keep on doing it because it's really got the basics in there. And now I've, I've got ninja courses all over my property. I, I'm super into 
like, okay, I'm going to go up the pegboard, then I'm going to climb this beam, then I'm going to ring the bell, then I'm going to come down the rope, I'm going to go up the rope, I'm going to ring the bell, I'm going to come back down the beam, I'm going to go across the pegboard, and I'm going to do maximum pull-ups. Like, that seems like it's more interesting and skill-based, a little bit scary, as opposed to just doing pull-ups. You know what I mean? I mean pull-ups are great, but but why not? For me, if I'm, a, if I'm going to keep on being as strong as I am and as healthy as I am, I have to figure out ways to turn up the volume but not get hurt in the process and occasionally I do but. well let's talk about that for a second because you talk about being doing stand-up and, and doing stand-up I've done a lot of public speaking Tony but I've never done stand-up and I've thought about taking some improv classes and doing some stand-up just just to, to get that experience to get that fear of being new again right that fear of, of being new and you just kind of alluded to and I want to come back to, to these obstacle courses but you kind of alluded to doing something scary with the obstacle course. How does that correlate? How does the fear of getting up in front of an open mic audience, like at the store, at the comedy store, and then doing something like an obstacle course, why is it good to have that sort of fear that you have to overcome? Why is it good to have a little bit of fear in your life sometimes? Well, that's where the learning comes from. That's where the learning comes from. I mean, you know, there's a lot of really super fit people that will avoid other things that require different kinds of fitness. Because they're, you know, because when you're really great at something, like you're, you know, you're a big, strong, muscular guy, the thought of going to Pilates or to, like me, you're not going to see me at a, an American Ninja Warrior. Tony, you should go. I'm 63 years old, man. I mean, you know, I don't think I have a chance. If they, when they have the senior division, maybe I might show <laughs> Or those mud runs and stuff. It's like, oh, look at the P90X guy. He's, he's dying over there. You know, for me, I, I know for a fact that I have a very long learning curve. Right. It just takes me like a lever. If anybody knows what a lever is, it's a regular pull up. Right. But a lever is something where you you're at the top and then you push the bar away from your body and then your body is parallel to the ground. It took me four months to learn how to do one rep. So so knowing that I have a long learning curve when I was younger prevented me from doing anything. Mm. Honestly, I would quit out of the box. I quit golf. I quit tennis. I quit, you know, I was a terrible skier. I kept going because I thought I was halfway decent, but I was terrible. And I just started learning from the experts and learning from people who are really good at things. And, 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 you know, I would say to folks, if you feel like you're kind of stuck or you're bored or you're not, or you're getting hurt a lot, then maybe you should expand your horizons and try other things because ultimately things like Pilates and yoga and specific core kind of work, a lot of proprioception. If you look at P90X2, we have this thing called post-activation potentiation, once for upper, once for lower. It just forces you to do stuff you ain't never seen. You know, like animal flow. A lot of people don't even know what animal flow is, but animal flow, you got crab and beast and, and, and um, bear and all these really unusual, it's like yoga and gymnastics and Cirque du Soleil. You know what I mean? And there's going to be a long ass learning curve for most people, especially if they're not flexible. And I would just say to anybody who's listening or watching, dabble in those areas where you feel like you've got a lot to learn because you will learn a lot. And that'll also help you improve in other areas where you're, where you feel like you're kind of stuck or you're just kind of plateauing a little bit. So um, that's it. And I've still been doing it. And, you know, you got to be careful because, because people can get hurt if they're already pretty good at something else and they're pretty fit at something else and they dive really, you know, dive into something right away, they can kind of overdo it. So, you know, be the tortoise, not the hare, but be, be willing to learn. Because learning is where transformation comes, and transformation can happen at any age. Well, that, that's that's a powerful message because I do think it's necessary to try different things. And I want to come back to this for a second because I have to say thank you for, for P90X2 because you mentioned PAP or you know, post-activation potentiation or what's called compound. It, it, there are different names for it. But right. can you explain? Because I love the science of it. It's something that I've taught people how to do in terms of uh, strength and power. And so when you came out with it, all of a sudden, the cool thing was you're raising awareness of why it's necessary to do power and explosive training. And then geeks like me, exercise science geeks like me can come on. All right, you see that? Well, here's the science and here's why it's beneficial because you don't get an opportunity to do that in a 90 second whatever thing that's being shot for TV. So give us a little overview of why P90, of why the second one was so effective and what PAP is, because I think it's such a cool system. Well, you know, it's a, it's a lot of it, part, section one or part of it is about symmetry, creating balance between your right and left side, right? And also how your body reacts in general while moving athletically on any possible plane, you know what I mean? So, you know, a lot of, like if you look at everything, riding a bike is linear, swimming is linear, your elliptical is linear, you know, your versa climbers, you know, it's we, we train in this direction, but when we play tennis or football or soccer, or baseball, or hockey, or any of those types of things, 
Um, it just, it, you know, it's about speed, it's about explosive power, and it's about a, a symmetry, your upper and lower body symmetry. And the cool thing is, it's training that doesn't require a lot of big space, like a lot of professional collegiate and Olympic athletes, they have fields and courts and, and they got a lot of room to kind of play with. Like if you watch the, the combine, you know what I mean? That's, you watch these athletes and all the different things they do going around cones and different kinds of things. Chances are that they have a decent conditioning coach that has got them doing some kind of, you know, post-activation potentiation. Cause you know, you you want to, you want to be able to, and what it teaches you is, for example, how does the right side react? How does the left side react? How you get those two things evened out so that you can also prevent injury. So um, that was another thing. I can't tell you how many people came up to me, and this was never our intention when we came up with P90X2, that said, I had a horrible back or I had this injury. I used P90X as rehab. A P90X2 is a rehab. There's this one soccer coach, Division One soccer coach that was kind of a you know, he was kind of, I think he played semi-pro soccer. His back was so jacked up that he, he, he couldn't play anymore. And so he became a coach and he was on all these meds. You know, he was on, on, on opioids and this, this a horrible hellscape that he was on. And he started doing P90X just very, very gently because he, you know, he knew that he couldn't do a lot of it. But by the end of the 90 days, it, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that you're going to use P90X2 as a means to, to fix your back. But when you're doing those types of routines, um, you know, like, for example, uh, uh, I've had a little sciatica thing and, 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 um, and I've got uh, plantar fasciitis all on the right side, which is such a nightmare, man, you know, so I'm doing my egoscue exercises, I'm doing my, my physical therapy exercises, and I'm foam rolling and I'm using the Theragun, right? So before, when I was a young, semi-athletic kid, because I wasn't terribly athletic, I was just taking a leave, hoping it would go away, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's what a lot of people are still doing. A lot of young athletes are just, yeah, hey, take, take some meds. You know what I mean? And, and the one thing about a PAP is it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't not, it not only helps you become a better athlete uh, that has better symmetry and who's more explosive is that can actually prevent you from getting hurt while doing the sport that you love. And that's what's kind of unique about it. And see, that's what I try to get people to understand, Tony, is that fitness is about having the ability to get out and do your favorite activities, to do your favorite things. Now, somebody like you, you like to move. So that kind of, it kind of goes hand in hand in hand. How have you changed? I mean, you, you kind of talked about, and this is where I want to come back to the obstacle course and what you're doing now, because you're 63 years old, but your energy, the way you look, the, just you, you're coming off as somebody who's like 43 years old, right? I mean, like, look at that. For, for viewer, if you're listening on the podcast, you couldn't see Tony just flash his gun and, and go to the, you, you can go to the YouTube channel. You'll, you'll see our interview. But Tony, dude, you're still shredded. You're, you're in your early 60s. How have you adjusted? Because like like you said with yoga years ago i overlooked yoga now i'd rather i'd rather be able to do an, an, an inversion or an arm balance than bench press 315 pounds because it's such a different style of moving your body but how have you adapted your programs and what really what's your fitness go to now that you're in your early 60s well you know it's back to that equation of boredom injuries and plateau so so you know there's two there's two kinds of love when it comes to what you're trying to achieve there's certain types of routines or exercise plans or, or, or coaches or trainers that you gravitate to because you love, you know, like these folks who just love mixed martial arts, right? Or they love boxing classes, which is great, right? You love that. You do that. That's awesome. But you're, you know, you're continuing to age. Aging is going to happen. You can't, you can do everything you want. You have your biological age, right? And you have your numerical age and, you know, whatever, but your biological age, I just had blood work done the other day and I get blood work every, every six months. And when I do it, my endocrinologist slash nutritionist will alter not, you know, the macros and micros. She doesn't have much to do with the, with the macros. I mean, I'm a vegan. I've been vegan for five months and I've been dabbling in veganism on and off forever. I was a flexitarian for a while when I wanted to eat more meat or whatever. <laughs> and, and my blood work came out last week, my testosterone. And I don't, I don't put any HGH, nothing. I am, I have, I'm as clean as it gets. I'll put some creatine in my shakes once in a while. My, my testosterone was 868 and my free was 80 something, which is, you know, which is psycho really. And that, it really comes is. down. Yeah. It's pretty, you know, like I even look at it and she says, like, are you sure you're not? No. Why would I lie to you? I'm not, I don't need to do that. And I'm worried about that. I don't want to mess with anything. My, my thing comes gravitating towards things that challenge me. And so when you're challenging yourself with new things, there's a greater likelihood that there's going to be more muscle recruitment. You know what I mean? You're going to hit the primaries, the secondary, and the tertiary muscle groups because I'm not just bench pressing anymore. I'm not just biceps curl. I'm not just 
doing goblet squats. I'm trying to get from here to there in a, in a timed thing. All right. Okay. Here we go, everybody. Ninja one. Uh, and a lot of people can't even get ninja one, right? You're going to do the same letter, bang, 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 and go to two balls and you're going to go two shafts and you go up to the triangle and you grab these silly things and you reach over and then you go to the, you go to the monkey bars and then you do the rings and you reverse the whole damn thing. Right. And you time that, right? So it's, it's hideous and it's horrible and guys fall and people get flappers and there's blood all over the damn place, but it just seems a whole lot more interesting to me. Um, and you got to stretch like hell and you got to do, you got to do your yoga because you know, the yoga is it's balance, obviously it's strength, obviously it's range of motion slash flexibility, obviously, but it's also mindfulness. So you learn these breathing patterns and there's so much like you look at uh, James Nestor's book, breath. I mean, have you, have you interviewed him lately? I mean, I, I, Tony, this is so funny. I was emailing his assistant today, trying to, the, trying to, trying to, he's, he's, he's traveling right now. So I, I'm definitely gonna have to send her this. Uh, I'm gonna have to send them this uh, interview because I, I've, I've started reading it and I realized I want to get him on. Yeah, breath. Because why is breath work so important? I mean, you, you, you go into this, and I love this because it's one of those things we overlook. But the more I kind of dig into it, and I know breath work has been a, a thing now for a while, but it's always been one of those things. Like, okay, I'll get to it at some point. But why is it so important to kind of slow down, stop, and spend a little bit of time just on our breath? Well, there are, you know, the one thing about breath work and, you know, you look at, uh, you look at Win Hof and he's been doing it. And so many others, uh, Stig, who's the other guy who's the big breath holder. Um, the dude, uh, uh, Laird, Laird Hamilton, I know. Is Laird, the Laird does it as well, but I think Laird kind of gets his stuff from Wim Hof. Um, um, the thing is, it's like, you know, you can meditate, but people don't like to meditate because there's, you know, there's different forms of meditation where you're kind of, you know, you're doing this four by four breathing when, and that's a Navy SEAL thing, but then they have all kinds of different kinds of breathing things. What is, what the idea with breath work is, is to, especially if you're doing something intense, like there's simple meditation where you're sitting there in Lotus or you're in a dark room or prayer, prayer is another, is usually sort of a, you're slowing your breath down. And that's something that's, which is awesome. Because it helps lower the cortisol levels, and you know, if you're drink, if you're all stressed out from either physically, mentally, or emotionally stressed out, and that happens because of life, because of fitness. I mean, you go to a ninja course, right? Your cortisol levels are like, what is happening? You know what I mean? You're just, it's, it's different than okay, I'm gonna do ten reps of this. It's predictable. Like I'm gonna take these weights, I'm gonna pick them up, and I know what I know what the weight is. I'm, I've decided in advance. I have a general th- knowledge of how many reps I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna put them down. I'm gonna hang out. And I'm either going to do another set slightly heavier, or I'm going to move the bench to incline, just using bench press as an example. But a ninja course is, is a much different experience that involves a lot more muscles. And so if you're all freaked out about it, right, if you're trying to get to the physical part, if you can get the mental and emotional, you know, we, we call it mindset. If you can get your mindset lined up, then there's an energy that's created there for you to be able to accomplish the exercise you know, and it's really a matter of seconds and a matter of speed and, you know, the, the kinds of things that will, the breath work will help you achieve your goals. But if you don't have the breath work and you're just, <laughs> right, if you're doing all the stuff that everybody's been doing since the beginning of time, slow that down, take the, take the grimace off your face, stop gnashing your teeth, stop throwing your brow, man, and just get, you know, kind of use the breath as a means to, you know, achieve what you're trying to achieve, whatever it is, your physical challenge. And, and not get fried, not, not get the adrenal glands and the cortisol levels through the roof. And, and the cool thing about uh, Nestor's book is it's breathing techniques for people who don't pray, who aren't religious and don't meditate. It's just simple science based on how you breathe. You know, I mean, there's, there's stuff where you can spot train based on injuries and stuff like that. There's a, there's a section in the book where he talks about 5.5 breathing. And that all the science and all the research has shown that a 5.5 second inhalation and a 5.5 second exhalation is sort of the ideal rate. You know, sometimes you do like a four by four, inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four. There's a bunch of different things. You know what I mean? That, you know, Wim Hof has, does a lot of mouth breathing. I don't mouth breathe at all anymore. When I meditate, it's all through my nose. I, I, you know, Nestor talks about taping his mouth. And when he said, tape your mouth, I've been taping my mouth for four months. Wow. And my, I've never slept better. I, I don't, you know, because here's the thing about mouth breathing. There's an, in, there's in the book, they talk about this Indian tribe called the McCann tribe. And uh, they're like these, everything were all fit. They all look like, like gymnasts or something. They're all six foot tall, the men and the women. 
blonde haired blue eyed Indians that would wrap them, their children, the minute their child was born, they would wrap their mouth because they understood that all the dust, all the dirt, all the disease, all the poison goes in the mouth and into your lungs. When it goes into your nose, it's filtered and goes into your stomach and then the stomach acids, right? So I don't know. Uh, a lot of people now with COVID are breathing through their nose, man. Well, well, I mean, whether it's, you know, so you probably that's doing just breath one breath. aspect to what I'm, what, what, how, how beneficial it can be. But you've probably been doing it as someone who, who went through and was trained as an actor and you were speaking on the stage, you probably, I mean, you have to project from your diaphragm and you have to use, learn how to use your voice. So at some point you were probably just inherently doing some of this breath work to, to anyway, weren't, would, would you, wouldn't you consider Yeah, that? I, I had one technique then. Now I have like 10 and, it, and, and that, that the for different versions based on different circumstances, I just shot 25 workouts in two weeks. And oh, when wow. I would shoot five workouts, I'd be like this after the fifth one. Yeah, I'd be like, what's going on? Oh, my God. Then lemon and apple peels, or whatever else we tried to get my voice back. <laughs> and I didn't lose my voice. I had energy throughout all 25. The day and a half after the, after the 25 workouts, I, I, I fell into a small coma. You know what I mean? Just because of that. Right? Put, turn the energy on. Okay, first workout, second workout, third workout, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and again and again. You know, so you do get a little burned out, but you know, I, I, I have an infrared sauna. I foam roll, I meditate, I have a jacuzzi tub. I just jump in there. There's, there's, you know, it's about rest and recovery as much as it is kicking ass. Oh, well, there, that's the secret. I mean, I don't want to say that's the secret, but, but one thing real quick, I want to come back to what you're saying earlier about being all hyped up. Cause when I was younger, in my twenties, we, we might've had the same playlist. It was all like hardcore Metallica. It was like punk rock. Even like, uh, what was it, the Dead Kennedys, Sex Pistols, like some of the good uh, Black Flag. I still love rocking some of the good 80s, good punk rock. Yeah. But now but now when I lift weights, Tony, when I do a kettlebell workout or when I'm doing like a TRX workout or, or I'm doing a hard workout, I listen to podcasts or I listen to comedy. Because what I'm trying to do is I don't want the music, because what I've learned, kind of what you referenced, is that getting over amped up elevates that cortisol and it kind of shuts your system down because you get over you get overexcited. So what I've learned sometimes is just listening to a good podcast, listening to a, a, a community. Yeah, I'll put on comedy on, uh, I'll put comedy on Pandora or pull something up. And you have to be careful sometimes. You start laughing when you're holding a heavy weight. That's a different nah, story. Yeah, I could be true. But it totally, so do you have, like when you're working out, whether you're on the ninja course or you're, you're doing a bodyweight workout or something, do you kind of have a go-to? Do you have music you listen to? Do you kind of just free freelance it how what kind of gets you into the zone when you're getting getting your sweat on well you know my obviously my yoga workouts are super it's just really soothing and lovely and mellow and and uh yeah but I still if i'm lifting weights or i'm on the ninja course or, or i'm doing cardio i mean i have the jamming playlist and i have my mammoth road trip playlist and i have my my sunday workout playlist and uh boy i can name them all I have my uh, military tour playlist, you know, so the military tour, they're usually, you know, I, I have to be careful, you know, there's the top brass. I can't be doing too much, you know, <laughs> too much rap or anything on that. But I mean, it's, it's, it's the who it's Zeppelin. It's I'll play the Beatles. I'll play the police. I'll play the clash. I'll play, you know, um, um, you know, a lot of this music. I really like that's got a beat. You know what I mean? I need, I need tunes, man. I can't eat like a podcast or comedy. I don't know how you do that. That's pretty impressive. Well, I don't think I could do that. Um, but, you know, I, I, when I'm done, when I'm in the cool down stage, I change the playlist to something more mellow. And I spend about 10 or 15 minutes kind of just, you know, decompressing from from the cranking, you know. But I, I turn it up pretty loud, man. And I play. My neighbors know all my playlists. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I'm sure that's a good thing. Hey, I want to switch gears real quick and, and say something that years ago, I can't remember. I was trying to think back, getting ready for this interview, when I heard you say that. And it must have been we were promoting P90X2, now, now that I think about it, because the timeline fits. But you were interviewed on the Jim Rome show one time. I and mean, maybe you've been on Jim Rome a couple times. But you were on an interview on the Jim Rome show, Tony. And you said something that I thought was a brilliant piece of advice. Because Jim asked you something like about a cheat day and, and like kind of like following a strict diet. But your recommendation was a cheat meal. And, and I really want – I mean, that was such – I think that was such a critical – piece of advice because your, your point was like, hey, don't waste, don't throw out because a lot of people make this mistake, right? And then I'll, I will have you talk a little bit about your approach to nutrition. 
But a lot of people make that mistake where they train great for five, six days in a row, but then what happens? Well, today's my cheat day, so now they take in 5,000 calories and just kind of crush what they just did the last five days. And I just want to give you, I want to give you credit because I've used that and I've credited you with it in, in conversations, whether with clients or at workshops, because I thought that was such just a brilliant piece, simple advice to say, hey, no cheat day, give yourself a cheat meal, but don't, don't turn it into a whole day. And, and by the way, Pete, you're partially right. Uh -oh. What I said was a cheat snack. Oh, okay. There a we cheat go. Snack. Because a cheat snack is a low calorie, just a little chocolate bar or, 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 or a couple of cookies or something. Cause it's a low calorie lower. Like a, like I just, I, you know, whatever I, people think I'm a fanatic or something, but I don't, I'm not able to do what I do and look how I look based on the fact that I cheat very often when it comes to anything, right? Hydrated, nourished, regular training, and then letting the, the pendulum swing in the other direction for a while so I can recover. That, that's really health and wellness one-on-one. And, and, you know, if somebody asks me that I have to, you know, perform on the drop of a dime or I got to do a photo shoot, it's not like I need three weeks to get my, get my act together so I can look ready. I mean, I, you know, I think I show up today and I'm ready. I'm always ready. You know why? Because I feel better this way. I perform better this way. And anytime I do cheat to any great level, which isn't really ever, you know, no caffeine, except for like a little pre-workout. I have a new performance line. There's a little caffeine in that, but it's time release. So you don't, you're not doing this, you know, in the middle of your workout. Um, but I mean, I haven't had booze in 35 years. I have no desire. I mean, me, look at me, me with a freaking cocktail in me <laughs> out of your freaking mind. It's going to be a problem. There's going to be crazy words going to come out of my mouth. And in a woke world, I'm going to piss off some people. I'll tell you. So yeah. I have to kind of tone things down. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happier this way. I, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to do something. I don't want to have to use some outside source so that I have to work extra hard to deal with what I, that, that little cheap thing. But I mean, you know, my cookies are vegan with quinoa. It, you know what I mean? They're, they're, there's no wheat, no soy, no corn, no dairy in my diet, none. Because I got blood tested over and over and over again. And it kept saying, don't put those things in your body because it's creating inflammation. Yeah. And the only inflammation I want are in my muscles. I don't want inflammation in my tendons. I don't want them in my ligaments. I don't want them in my joints. I don't want them in my spine. I don't want them in my brain. And so food is this number one source. You got a brand new Ferrari, right? You're going to put a banana in the, in the, in the tailpipe and go to Mexico and put some 32 octane gas in the thing. Now I got a racehorse. You're not going to give it double cheese chimichangas. This is the racehorse. You can replace the horse. You can replace the car, not replaceable. Right. And so, so to me, it's just common sense. Does it require a whole lot of discipline? Does it require like a, like a very specific purpose? You know, my purpose is to, excuse my French, kick ass until the day I die. That's my, I, I heli skiing. I want to go heli skiing. I love heli skiing. So I want to do that in my, when I retire in my seventies and eighties and nineties, I want to heli ski in my nineties. I don't think it's that unreasonable. Well, I can do a ninja course in my sixties. I can heli ski in my nineties. Well, that's so, just it, Tony is, is, is the thing I point out to people all the time. And this is the reason why I wrote my new book, Ages Intensity. There's a shameless plug. And we'll get yours in here. But, but, but in all honesty, you, you're in that first generation and, and you're a few years older than me. I just turned 49 this year. So you're 14 years older than me. But you are at the vanguard. There, there's Tony's new book, The Big Picture. And we'll talk about that in, in just a second. But, but you're, in the, you're in the vanguard, Tony, of people who've grown up their entire lives exercising. So you're, you're in that group who now that you're, now that you're in your 60s, you don't want to slow down. You don't want to do water aerobics. You don't want to do chair aerobics. So you want to still keep going hard, but you want to do it smarter and stay injury free. So you can go hella skiing. So you can go big wave, sur wave surfing. So you can ha hook, out, hook up with those guys in the North shore. I mean, do you, do you recognize that fact? Have you, have you taken a step back and looked and said, wow, this is really because you are part of that. And I credit you with that because you are, you and, and your contemporaries, who've been that first generation of fitness advocates out there, you really are changing how we look at the aging process. Well, I'm one of a few. I'm one of a few. A lot of people want to slow down and take it easy, but, but you know, I, I'm a fan of thriving as opposed to surviving. And that's what most people are doing. They're doing the basics. They're feeding themselves and they're paying their bills and they're going to work and they're hanging out with their family and they're drinking beer, watching the game. And, and that's all fine. It just seems a little bit boring to me. And, and, uh, 
you know, I, I like to, I like to just chill too. I like to just sit and watch, you know, the, the, the NFL's kicking in here soon. I can't wait to sit down and watch a couple of games, but I will record them and I will fast forward, you know, even between the play, they, like I can turn a four hour football game into like 90 yeah, minutes. Guilty. I you know do what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. I, there's ways to do it now, which is awesome. It gives me more time to do things that are sort of more, have create more value for me. But, but yeah, I, you know, and, and I, my, most people aren't aware of this, but I was not a fit kid. You know I mean? I was, I mean, I, I was on the football team in high school, but I never I didn't play. I think I was in two plays an entire season when the score was like 47 to two, three safety. Um, that sounds like my college career. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just not much of a player. No. Um, and I was an okay tennis player. I was an okay golfer. You know, um, I liked individual sports. I seemed to do a little bit better. That's why I like skiing, I suppose, because I'm only competing with, with, with mother nature there. Um, uh, but yeah, so it, it was, it, it required me to, you know, I took a weightlifting class in college and I noticed a transformation, which was really blew my mind. I, Cause most people just assume that they are how they are and that's how they're going to age. And then that's what their parents did and their grandparents and their great grandparents did, but you can change your genetics in your lifetime. I mean, you have, you have three different things that have a direct effect on who you are on any given day and who you will become as you age. And, and genetics is certainly one of them. Your parents had sex. That's you, right? Are you an ectomorph, a mesomorph, an endomorph, or some combination thereof? It's because, you know, your parents came together. But you also have your, your the environmental component. You know what I mean? An environment is not only, you know, you're not going to be building a fitness gym at, for, at Fukushima or Chernobyl. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you need clean air, clean water, right? And there's also the stress factor. Like stress is the is the silent killer and we're under some kind of physical, mental, and emotional or environmental stress all the time. And how are you mitigating the, that, the negative aspect of that? And last but not least is behavior. You know what I mean? And, and behavior has a lot to do with how you communicate with people, not just smoking, drinking, eating, training, or likewise. It's like, it's just your, your ability to deal with situations, you know, uh, outside aggravation or whatever is outside. There's, because there's finger pointers and naysayers and haters and all these people and if they're going to let you you know if you're going to have falling outs with people left and right and you're you know it's it's you against me kind of a mentality well of course your cortisol levels are going to go through the roof and your adrenal glands are going to fry and you're going to end up with you know you're doing everything right but you end up with cancer because not not because you did anything wrong you know with your 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 you know your genetics it had everything to do with your your inability to be able to just forgive and to love people regardless of how stupid they are but that's so powerful is just being able to, I mean, and just, I, I'm with you on that. I haven't had a drink in 13 years because it's kind of like, and, and you, you kind of said it, well, you mix alcohol with me. That's not a good combination. I'm one of these people that I kind of, I, I kind of gave up my right for that a long while ago. And, and so I totally, I'm with you on that because, and the other thing I look at it too, though, is now I don't want to waste time on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Not that I wake up Johnny on the spot bright and early. But I don't want to be sitting there dragging tail with a hangover in my 40s or 50s. I don't want to I mean that kind of it's one thing to go out and have a couple of drinks, but that kicks your butt. I mean, you, you want to yeah, talk man. about you want to talk about putting bananas in the tailpipe of a Ferrari. I wouldn't tell anybody not to drink. But if you really want to optimize your performance, I, I think there's there's some evaluation that can be made there about whether or not that's something that really should be a part of your life. There's good behavior and there's bad. And it's, and it's not like you have to take an AP psychology course to figure out what the difference is. You just have to figure out within inside yourself, whether, you know, how much of those two things you want to do, you, you know what I mean? And so it's really, life is really pretty simple when you can figure out, you know, ways in which to, to be consistent with your behavior, your positive behavior. And a lot of it has to do with, the, with, with, the, with the people in your life. Like I, you know, I, this book, now that I've somehow just snuck it into the conversation, that's perfect. These eleven Big laws. Are, these eleven laws are things that I practice you know, every week, all the time. It's it's not, you know, and it's and it, like I have a, uh, this guy who's putting an awning on, on my house. He came to the house. And he wanted. We started talking. We talked, we talked awning and fitness. And he's on he's on chapter seven. He came today to pick up the check, the deposit, and he goes. Everything in your book is common sense, like purpose. Like who would have thought that purpose? is not about six pack abs and big arms and chest and how much how much you can bench. That's your purpose if you're in high school or college on a football team. But for the rest of us that plan on moving into the future, your purpose should be health and wellness and, and, and being pain free and having enough energy to attack your life. That's really, you guys said, and that takes all the pressure off. You know what I mean? Because most people's purpose is about their history, their past, their future and other people's expectations of them. And if you free yourself of, 
what you hope is going to happen in the future and what you used to be in the past and what people say about you, then you can just find a purpose that's all about you. You know what I mean? And that's, he goes, wow, that's just all of a sudden, I just want to be there for my kids. That's a good purpose. I just want to be able to, you know, go run a half marathon. That's a good purpose. You know what I mean? I want to be able to improve my posture. There you go. Now you're on the right track. But you're, you know, the guy's 42. Does he care about the, the, the size of his arms? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And then there's, of course, there's the plan. Like, what are you going to do and when are you going to do it? Right? I mean, so I told him, get a calendar and then make red X's every time you work out. I got this 30, 31 days in a month. You better have at least 22 or you wasted your time. Because 15 days on and 15 days off, it's a tie. And then you're going to look, you know, might as well throw yourself down a set of stairs. Because you're going to get sore, but you're not going to have a lot of physical change or transformation, right? And then, and then last, you know, oh, there's a, all the laws, but another one is, is accountability. Who's your tribe, man? Who are the, who are the people kicking butt and taking names who are there to drag you kicking and screaming, whether you want to go or not. And you can do that for them too. And with me, I, I work out, I schedule seven workouts a week, seven. Do I do all seven? No, today is a Friday and I'm taking today off, but I scheduled this routine called balls and back boxes, but I got this sciatica thing in my foot. So those two part body parts aren't going to be a fan. So I, I emailed everybody who would normally be here and I say, hey, let's take today off. Um, but when you schedule seven, you'll probably show up for five. If you schedule three a week, mm. you'll probably do two. And that means four or five days off. And why bother? Honestly, you're going to end up with exercise bipolar disorder that way. So, you know, the idea here is to keep the norepinephrine, the dopamine, the serotonin, the brain drive, neurotropic fat, keep that in your head because you are the source that way alcohol, drugs, blah, 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 having sex with strangers, that source outside of yourself are little temporary highs that lead to problems, long-term problems. But when you get up, when you get a little giddy up and you're eating healthy and you've got the right people to do it with, then you're releasing these chemicals inside of your brain so that you can, you know, really feel good about the direction your life is going. Well, that's exactly, but no, that's exactly what your obstacle course is doing. And that's what I, I talk about it here on, on the podcast quite a bit, my mountain biking, but that's exactly what those things are doing is they're creating that challenge. They're cre creating that serotonin rush, that dopamine rush. And it's really, that's what people don't understand that when they go out and do these other things, whether it's alcohol, sugar, sex, gambling, you know, and that's all they're really looking for is they're looking for instead, I mean, that, go play on an obstacle course. I mentioned to you yesterday, I was at a trampoline park with my kids and I was jumping off the 10 foot ledge into the big airbag and it scared the heck out of me. I told both my daughters it was really scary. But I'm like, wait, I have a chance to go jump in an airbag. I mean, that's something you don't get a chance that's to cool, do. That's cool, man. You know, that's right. and it, yeah. but but that's why. But the point being, but that's why you stay fit and stay active. And I want to come back to the scheduling thing, Tony, because that's one of the questions I'd wanted to ask you. Number one, when do you schedule? Like, when do you sit down and look at your week, or do you look at your month? How do how do you schedule? And then number two, like today, you called an audible with an off day. But if there's a day when just meetings are stacking up or the schedule's getting hectic. What's your go-to like little mini workout, your go-to little workout snack, if you will, when you know you're not going to have the time to get your full to get your full mojo on that you normally would? Well, I'm, I'm in a very unique place, unlike most people. So the example that I'm going to give you in regards to me will not be when most people that have regular jobs and families and kids and stuff. Right. So but there's that there's a second answer to that question. For me, you know, I've got a pattern based on on my priorities. My priorities is these are these are these are the days. I mean, I schedule, like I said, seven days a week. So everybody, everybody in my world, my account, my, my not my accountant so much, but my assistant and my wife and, and, and the people that work for me know that, that Mondays is, is cardio and it's at 5.30 or somewhere between 5.30 and 5, 5 o'clock and 5.30, depending on, you know, what time people get home. But I usually make those 5.30 at my house because I have, you know, like I said, I got my cardio night is uh, three to five minutes on the bike. The Versa Climber, the treadmill, the heavy bag, the jump rope, the rower, and the ski machine. We go round and round and round, and we either do it three three minutes each. If it's only two or three of us, we'll just do three minutes, like bang, 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 bang. We'll just keep going around until the clock goes ding, 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 one hour, you're done, right? And we're usually soaking wet and fired up, or we'll go for a run. I mean, I have 17 miles in my backyard. So, hey, you guys up for the run? The weather's perfect. Let's go do that instead. And so, or I have an e-bike and we just get on our e-bikes, man, go up hills because it's fun on an e-bike. And, you know, you don't burn as many calories because they're getting a little help, but I can always play with my, my e-bike so I can work harder. So those are, that's card, that's Monday, that's five, 
5.30. Tuesday in the morning, somewhere between 7.30 and 8.30, depending on people's schedule. It's been shoulders and arms, and it probably will be to the day I die. That's just the way it is. And no two workouts are the same. Sometimes they're all handstands. Handstands, 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 and bicep curls. Other times I'm on my tonal, and I'm just doing you know various cable stuff on the tonal um, and dumbbells or whatever, doing Arnold's or militaries or flies or reverse flies or whatever you want to, you know. And then we get buys and tries. Sometimes on a stability ball, sometimes with dumbbells, sometimes body weight. We just, I just walk in the room and go, okay, let's do something different. Wednesdays is plyo. I did plyo last Wednesday. I, three people showed up. I invite 25 because typically only three people show up <laughs> because it's plyo and plyo sucks. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, it's hit training, brutal. All right, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 reps of left, right, east, north, south, you know, jumping, whatever. It's, it's, it's a bear, but it's the reason why I can ski without having to lift a single weight. Right. So, and then uh, Thursdays uh, is chest and back, chest and back. Fridays is this balls and boxers routine. Saturday is yoga. And Sunday is the four hour ninja course workout with, with anybody between four and, and, and 10 people. Haven't had the 10 so much because of COVID and stuff, but, and that's it. They're scheduled. They're in the books. And everybody knows that that's, that's the priority. Don't schedule anything <laughs> anywhere near any of them. All right. And then like the average person, if you want to thrive, like your thing is like, okay, I've been surviving and this is great. And I got this gut on me. And, I, and then the escalator went out the other day and I got two heavy suitcases and that was a nightmare, but it shouldn't be, you know what I mean? It should, life should be, you should be able to move. You should be able to groove. You should be able to hang out with your kids. You should be able to try things. You should be able to go on bike rides. You should be able to, you know, at least go ice skating or something. But if, if you've discovered that your activity level is shrinking as you're getting older, then you better make a shift because your retirement's going to suck. It's you're like, oh, 65. Well, great. Now what do I do? Now I'm so damn old and I got so many injuries and problems that I got to get all that figured out. And it's just going to make the journey harder. So why not? The sooner you're in the, the sooner you start, the better off you'll be. And so just schedule it, schedule it with somebody if you can, a, a spouse or your kids or, or, or somebody online, whatever it is. I mean, I got 2000 people in a, in a, in a Facebook page called Power Nation uh, during the pandemic, right? Because gyms closed down. And one of the guys that was in it was an overweight scientist, kind of an insecure guy, not much of a talker, showed up here two Sundays ago, and there's 16 extra, 16 things, and they're all like, the first one is 20-foot rope, maximum pull-ups, come down the rope, you can't use your feet, you know what I mean? That's like, he showed up and just That's did tough. That. you know what I mean? Yeah. And he beat five of us, who has been doing this for years, uh, he beat us on two or three exercises. One Whoa. of the exercises is maximum pull-ups in, in one minute. He beat everybody. No, I'm sorry. 50 pull-ups, shortest period of time. And he, he, I had the best number until he got up and beat me by two. And he's never been here before. You know what I mean? So if you're consistent and you're, you're the tortoise and you're not the hare and you're showing up five to six days a week and you keep you add all that variety and you make it a priority, because honestly, I, I got kids, I got a job. I just You know what that means to me? You just don't want it that enough. It's not a priority to you. Yeah, you that's it. You use those priority. excuses until the day you die sooner than you should. Fine. Yeah. Go ahead. See, I can't help you. Worst kind of advice to give is the kind that's never been asked for in the first place because my best intentions are received with resentment. I can I can lead that horse to water. You ain't gonna drink. I can't help you, man. I, that, that's kind of what I feel. If people don't have, if people can't learn how to make it a priority, hey, it's you're not ready for it. That's fine. I just I, we're not we're not aligned. But once you're ready to sit down and say, okay, three, four, five days a week. Because to me, if you schedule three, three turns into four, four turns into five. And then ultimately, personally, I try to schedule something every day, but at least one day a week, it's a nice long walk where I'm not on, on the hill, where I'm not lifting weights, where I'm not swinging a kettlebell. You know, I try to kind of mix it up a little bit yeah, great. So, that, so that one day it's at least it's a walk. Now, to, to, to start wrapping it up here, what's power life? Because this is pretty cool stuff. I think what you're doing now is really, I think it's, it's so cool because you're all about promoting health. That's exactly what we've been talking about. And what exactly is Power Life and how'd you get, how'd you get it going? How'd you get started with it? Well, when I left Beachbody three years ago, um, it was time to kind of begin to expand my, my repertoire and begin to do things that I wanted to do at Beachbody, but they wouldn't let me. You know what I mean? They, they were, I was competing with, I don't know how many other trainers over there waiting. I was sitting around waiting my turn half the time. And every time they tapped me on the shoulder, they gave me something I didn't want to do. And then early on, it didn't, didn't, it wasn't that way because that was just me and Shalene and Sean T. So I didn't have to wait that long in line. Um, and like, Oh, I want a supplement line. Nah, well, we, we can't really do that. All right, whatever. You know, I want to do, I want my own fitness equipment. Yeah, no. 
all right, well, I'm out of here, man. Oh. You know, and I also, they also didn't want to pay me anymore. So that was another thing. Um, so, you know, when everybody found that I was available, there was a lot of this, hey, you want to you <laughs> help? And then, you know, this company called Golden Hippo, they're the parent company for Power Life. And, and they, they followed me pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of people that worked over there who used to work for, for Beachbody and knew that I got super sick back in 2017. I ended up with Ramsey Hunt syndrome which led to vestibular hypofunction, which is sort of the after effect when you're all the, all the nerves in your brain fry as a result of getting shingles in your ear. So you get shingles in a lot of places and one in a hundred thousand people who get shingles, get it here and ding, 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 lucky me, I was one of them. So it affected my smell, my taste, my vision and my balance, wow. which made me very nauseous. I lost 25 pounds in a very short period of time and it doesn't ever really totally heal. It will improve, but it takes years if you do everything right most people don't do everything right so it never really thoroughly heals so a lot of people who get what i got become recluse because their balance stays bad a lot of people get bell's palsy which i had but i got rid of it in four four weeks most people have it forever so they're drinking through a straw their eye hangs they have to wear a patch it's a nightmare for some folks but i was just determined to kick the living crap out of it based on everything that i knew i pushed the edge of the envelope but i also did a lot of meditation more than ever um, uh, and so that, that was that, that, when I came out of that, I said, look, you know, I lost all this weight and I'm doing this fancy whey protein powder and it's giving me, you know, agita and stomach bloating. So they came up with a formula for me based on a lot of the research that they had seen in regards to HMB You know, HMB and HMB, which is something that you would find in beef or chicken or fish. It's like kind of like creatine, but it's, it's just a muscle building thing, but on its own, you'd have to eat like 18 steaks. This wouldn't work. Right, so you could they put these concentrated amounts of HMB, but they discovered it on this these research the HMB and the vitamin D, like and people are short on vitamin D anyway, right? I mean, because a lot of people are avoiding the sun and wearing sunblock and everything. Um, so large HMB, vitamin D, and it really helps activate leucine, which is one of the branch chain amino acids. And dude, I mean, girl, I was you know, it just it was helpful for me. And we have whey, we have plant based, we have chocolate, we have vanilla, and so we just put it out to the masses, and then. Based on my on my post uh, Ramsey Hunt thing, um, I had Epstein Barr, so I was like half. I had narcolepsy. I was like, oh. you know, I was just exhausted, taking naps all the time. I just my energy was in the toilet. And leaky gut. So many people have leaky gut, and they've heard that expression. They have no idea what it is, but it's basically poop that makes its way before it finds its final exit. It starts leaking through your intestines because your intestines are not these. They're very porous. And then, you know, if, if fecal matter is in your body, it's in your bloodstream, and that is a number one for inflammation. I used to have shoulder pain here and knee pain. I used to have to get um, PRP in my, my knees. I don't need any of that anymore, and it had to do with the. So I had to get off wheat, soy, corn, dairy, which I'm still off of, tomatoes, sesame seeds, onions, white rice. I mean, the list was forever. And so for three months to help heal my leaky gut, um, I had to get off of all these foods. So, I mean, I was eating like a prince. And, I, and I, then I start to introduce those words. Like I got the, the sesame seeds. Oh, I can have that again. Oh, almonds. I can have those again. You know what I mean? But the wheat, soy, corn, and dairy, which is sort of the bulk that most people, everybody who goes to these tests have to get off of that. And so we built all these supplements based on, on my needs based in, and they're not cheap. You know what I mean? That's the thing. If you want high, high quality ingredients, but we do great deals. If anybody's listening and they go to uh, mypowerlife.com, that's mypowerlife.com. Uh, and you put in the code Tony30. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do this or not, but whatever. You get 30% off uh, with Tony30. And you can buy two or three or four or five or six and you save even more money. And so, I, I mean, I'm addicted to my stuff because it was made for me. And it was made for people. Like a lot of people who are my age and our age suffer from something called sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss. You don't see a lot of 85-year-olds that are friggin' jacked. You know what I mean? It's because, you know, I mean, that just happens. It's just harder for older folks to build mass. And so, and that, and you know, look, I sound like a salesman trying to sell a car, but if you talk to the people who have done it, like part of our, my power nation family of 2000 people, because the power of four is food, fitness, supplementation, and mindfulness. Those are the four boom pillars to the whole equation. And, and I said, Hey, look, you can take any supplement you want, but you better find a high quality one. And you can also use mine and save 30%. So a lot of them have, and, and the testimonials are just like, you see these people who are kind of a little pudgy, a little overweight, and now they're lean and ripped. You know what I mean? 
because I'm making them work out six days a week. <laughs> I, and, and, a uh, and I want them to eat, you know, plants. You can be paleo or keto or vegetarian, pastry. I don't care what you can, you can be that, but just eat plants for God's sakes. Um, and steak and, and fish and chicken or not, you know what I mean? And, and take, try my supplements. And, uh, you know, so that so far that's, that's the reason why we came up with it. And, uh, so that's, that's power life. This is power nation, which is that group of people in that, in that, who are, who are basically my guinea pigs going through these 47 workouts now down to 25. Well, I think that's so impressive, Tony, because reading about doing, again, doing the research to get ready for this interview, reading about what you went through with, with that disease, it's amazing how many people let something like that. Like I got Lyme disease back in 2004 and still have a little Bell's palsy in my, in my right eye. I mean, my whole face was numb for about the right side of my face was numb for about six months. And it's funny because it's like, okay, I had Lyme disease. I got it treated and whatever. I don't think about it anymore. And I saw something somewhere where somebody's like, well, I, I, they, they sound like they couldn't do something because they had had Lyme disease. And I wanted to write back to them and like, get over it. I mean, so what? I mean, big deal. You have two feet, you can stand, you can move. Don't let anything. It always surprises me when somebody gets some kind of like diagnosis and, Oh, I can't do that because I have X, Y, Z. I'm somebody who took a cast off my wrist so I could play rugby and I didn't miss the rest of the season. I mean, my hand never really, really healed. Right. But that's a whole other conversation, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's the mentality. So with getting back to your fitness after, after going through that, what were the first couple of workouts like? And why is it so important not to let yourself be limited by what you experienced? Well, my whole career was based on, you know, being able to transcend and disseminate my philosophies and techniques and methods and whatever. And so, you know, I would have had to downsize quite a bit, sell both houses, move into a van down by the river with my wife. <laughs> you, you wouldn't have gone for that. You know what I mean? And, and, and here's the crazy thing, man, all, all the tinctures and potions and autorhinolaryngologists and, and, and docs and, and everybody else, they could only do so much, but the rest of it was really up to me. You know what I mean? I want to get off the meds. I had, I had dizziness medication, nausea, nausea medication and, and, and appetite stuff. And it was just all cr crap. I just didn't want to put my body anymore. And so I knew the one thing that brung me was, was eating healthy food and exercising on a regular basis. And, and to answer your question more specifically, I mean, I got down on the floor and I got, I got, I could do 12 pushups. And it felt, it just felt like there was a train on my back mm. and pull-ups. I think I did four or five, you know, I mean, I've done 110 push-ups in a row. I mean, I couldn't do that now, but I could probably do 70. Um, and I've done 38 pull-ups in a row, pretty clean. I beat some master sergeant on, on a military base in Japan. He was pissed. Nice. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't try to do a pull-up contest with me, man. You know, unless you're, unless you're, I don't know, a rock climber or a gymnast or something, I'm pretty good at those. But I mean, it was really wild to be super strong. And then in, a, in the course of a three, three weeks to be so weak. And then another four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months to be able to even function normally again. I couldn't drive a car. I would pull up to a, I'd pull up to a stop sign and I'd look to the right. And here's what my brain would do. I'll be there in a second. Oh, Wham. And then I go, oh no, I got to And I would go like this and it would just track really slowly. You know, it was just really horrible, horrible, horrible. But what a fabulous lesson because I was dabbling in mindfulness practices and, and breathing techniques and meditation. Now I do it every day. I do, I do it when I get up in the morning. I do it when I go to bed at night. I do it throughout the day. And like, for example, this, this 5.5 breathing, you, you don't have to be you can do it anywhere at any time and you can do it for five minutes and it has, it has very positive results. You know, it really does change you. So, so in a way, you know, like with you and Lyme disease, a lot, it, a lot of people are diminished for the rest of their life. People who get Ramsey hunt diminished for the rest of their life, but that's just in a way, I mean, if you, if you lose a leg in an accident, you're not going to grow a leg. All right. I don't care how badass your attitude is. You're, you're not, a, you're not a lizard, <laughs> kind of tough to do. But you're going to find a way to get a prosthetic on that thing and go, go run a half marathon or something if you want to, or you're a cat in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. I mean, it really depends on, you know, and there's all kinds of different kinds of people that have, you know, that just don't have the right influences, the right backgrounds, the right, you know, the right peers or the right parents, you know, or the, or their, or the right DNA or genetics that, that will, you know, where they can grab themselves by the bootstraps and giddy up, you know, other folks like you and me, we just want to feel good and have that energy and figure it out. You know what I mean? And so, so, and that's what you and I are here for. I mean, that's the cool thing. People will learn from this. I would hope. I mean, it, like, damn, that guy's 63. 
I mean, sure, he dyes this part of his beard, but no one knows that. <laughs> I, I bleep! I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll hit the edit on that one. But hey, Tony, man, it's great. It's great to to have this conversation with you. Tell tell us about your book one more. Tell the name of your book one more time, and then it's well, uh, the, the life. book is called "The Big Picture" by Tony Hort. The Eleven Laws will change your life. There it is. Look at that guy. And uh, and then of course, if you want to know about my Paragon experiences or my live events, I have a I have an annual ski snowboarding yoga treat in Jackson Hole every year. If you like to rip and then start your day and finish your day with some yoga, um, then join us uh, there. Uh, you know, you just go to TonyHortonLife.com. And um, also, if you want to know more about Power Nation and how to get involved with that, there's still one more final month. Um, and you can go under the contacts tab and then you can reach out to us and we'll tell you where to go there uh, to be part of Power Nation. We're in our final month of three separate beta groups, if you can believe that, or in, in, in provisional months in between the three month beta groups. But we have one more in September. It's a brand new schedule. Um, and there's, you have access to all 47 plus pantry workouts and all these special guests and, mind, and, uh, and mindset and mindfulness seminars and things like that, mastermind classes. There's a lot in there for $28 a month. Uh, so check it out there too. And, uh, and then, we, then we're gonna release a raw version of the final program. That's minus timers, minus graphics, minus music, just so people can you know, keep going. And that'll be coming up next. So uh, TonyHortonLife.com will take you where you wanna go. That's awesome, man. And hey, I got a friend that owns a studio, has a fitness studio in Jackson Hole. So if you need a place to- uh, Oh, who's, who's that? It's uh, Vim, V-I-M Studio. It's uh, right in. It's right in Jackson. Uh, I was there two years ago, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I can I can put you in touch. Who, who, you know, who you know? Who's the name of the person? Julie. Julie at Vim. Yeah, I'm Julie at Vim. Because I know the people, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna hunt her down, man. Yeah, because if you yeah if you need a place in Jackson, she's uh she's good people. She's I've I've worked with her for a little while and. Um, I know she listens to the podcast, so Julie, I'm giving you a shout out, but <laughs> that way, because I think, hey, you're, what you're doing is awesome. If, if I can have a tenth of your energy now and carry that through for the next number of years, man, and that's, that's, that's what's so cool about you is that you, you, you don't just talk it, you walk it. You're an example of, of how to make this a priority in your life and your example of the benefit when you make it a priority in your life. So, Tony, hey, it's a pleasure to meet you and a pleasure to have this conversation. Thank you for your time. Pete, likewise, man. I don't think it'll be our last. And uh, if you're ever in the City of Angels, man, come on. We'll do. We'll go through the Ninja Course on a Sunday. I think you'll enjoy yourself. I'll definitely take you up on that. All right, man. Thank you, sir.